If you get pleasure out of watching a man beg, cry, or apologize in an attempt to save his livelihood, then there might be something wrong with you. But then again, there might be something wrong with a lot of us. I mean, we are conditioned to find these human dramas compelling, if not from a compassionate place, but a selfish, almost hypnotic part of the brain that is concerned only with its own survival. And one man down is one less step to the top for all of us, right? We are actively conditioned by serialized dramas, but also by the very reality television programs that have washed network TV of any of its already scant integrity. We have gotten so base, so craven, that we delight in the downfall of others and seem to delight even more when the drama is real. Watching like a tale of people who sat on high but tumbled down at an accelerated pace. Before we know it, succumbing to what only can be called the lynch mob of public opinion, we get to watch as a man or a woman sit down in front of a chair, all natural, and attempt to keep themselves composed, maybe force a tear, or deploy a social hack, anything to garner back at least some sympathy they may have lost due to whatever series of words came out of their mouth. These guys and really all YouTubers are like little flies, trying to get at a food source. And all around this lump of tree sap is this giant spider web. At first, the silky geometric grid is easy to fly through. The vernacular of taste is ever growing, and like the strands of web, the gaps become smaller as the lexicon is filled in. Big gaps in the web lets in all but those who cannot fly straight, and for a while, life is good. And the flies become larger and well fed, but the spider is always working. Always building a stronger, more detailed mesh, and eventually the flies get caught up more and more. As the web becomes less and less selective, we watch as YouTube devours even mighty channels, leaving behind only a shell and a legacy soon wiped away by an algorithm. It's like the circle of life. Birds eat spiders, but hate ants. Spiders learn to walk like ants, birds don't eat them. What they learn, we learn. We observe the wild world of internet celebrity behind a thick layer of glass. We're like kids yelling at lions in a zoo. Reality TV, TMZ, a culture of fame obsession, the rise and the tragic fall of various beautiful human beings thrust from the world of success in most violent fashion. The drama of life. But it is fascinating to watch, to learn, to see what good society thinks and what regular society thinks it thinks. Now let's talk about this PewDiePie incident the way that we should. I think you know which incident I'm talking about. He was on a stream playing a game in which he was competing with others. He misses a shot and blurts out a word very casually that would blow back a blue hair's wig. Immediately he backpedals and sort of half-asses an apology right there on the spot. Now, think about what might be going on in that man's head now for the rest of the stream. He has to be thinking the entire time, man, I am fucked. I know what's coming, and I'm not prepared for it. There goes my channel. YouTube is probably going to shut me down. No, wait. No, I have, I have 55 million subs. But what if I lose a lot of subs? Before he can formulate a strategy, he is surrounded on all sides by people who are more than ready to arraign him before the court of public opinion and try him for his crimes. But to the question, did PewDiePie do anything wrong? It depends on what we're talking about. Did he violate the law? No. Did he do something really stupid and hurtful? Yes, without a doubt. You could say many words throughout a day and no one will really care about. But certain ones, when said a certain way, hold power over people. It's like the magic word that operates a spell that immediately turns your friends into enemies. It's the type of word that targets a very specific part of human survival. That is of being challenged. The fight or flight instinct literally kicks in when someone says something to you so intentionally to get under your skin, being called out, I believe we call it. They're the kind of words that challenge who you really are inside and makes you want to fight to disprove it. 
Quickly, the court gets to work on the paperwork and Pudes is walked up to the podium in handcuffs. His crime? Calling out an entire race of people. It's a pretty fucking dumb thing to do. Yes, your freedom of speech is a freedom from prosecution. This does not protect you, however, from someone punching you in the face for it. That's an entirely different set of laws. See, the general rule here, according to Carlinians, is either we have unlimited rights or we have no rights at all. Personally, I lean toward unlimited rights. I feel, for instance, I have the right to do anything I please. But if I do something you don't like, I think you have the right to kill me. So where are you going to find a fairer fucking deal than that? So the next time some asshole says to you, I have a right to my opinion, you say, oh yeah, well I have a right to my opinion, and my opinion is you have no right to your opinion. <laughs> then shoot the fuck and walk away. But this philosophy can only get you so far. Chasing away bad ideas with the threat of violence is just as bad as chasing away the good ones. Talking through ideas, both good and bad, is the civilized way that society is supposed to handle these problems. But then again, we've never been terribly civil, have we? In 399 BC, Socrates stood before a jury of 500 Athenians. His crime? He was accused of refusing to recognize the gods recognized by the state. The second set of charges determined that through his non-recognition, Socrates was corrupting the minds of the youth. He was found guilty of the crime and was sentenced to death by imbibing a drink composed primarily of hemlock. His judge and jury was quite literally the public. He voted overwhelmingly to kill him. A central nervous system poison is what he was made to drink. It would be the way that one of the most celebrated philosophers in recorded history would have died in the court of public opinion. Back in the trial of Pudes, far removed from the hallowed halls of academia, we see that the court has begun attacking. Before Pudes can even express his thoughts on the subject, he is immediately chased into a hole through which he must stuff down whatever deviant thoughts he does have, so no one will ever see them again. Instead of exposing them to the light of public scrutiny, when you expose a bad idea to the public, they will criticize it. Hell, we do that with even good ideas. But looking at bad ideas and forcing these people to talk about them openly and honestly is the only way you can get someone to examine those thoughts. When someone examines an idea closely, it is weakened. Every consideration for every argument that you have ever had will start to crumble apart with every yeah but that someone interrupts you with. Because no idea is ever perfect, you sort of wear away at the power that that belief has. To open a conversation, a few rules should be adhered to. Like in the book, Kindly Inquisitors, there are only two laws that matter in liberal science. No final say, and no special authority. The first rule means that there is no final say in science because it is always possible to learn more. Imagine all of the simple freedoms we take for granted that are given to us by this very same adherence to this law from a governance standpoint. We pass no final laws because even the best law can be improved and even the best intention laws can hurt innocent people. All things must be tweaked, all knobs turned, all valves bled, all propositions questioned. The second point which I believe to be even more important is that no one has special authority. It means that your results must be reproducible no matter who is conducting the test. The law loops back into the no final say law because it is inevitable that when you experiment something, it'll be contested. The results will differ upon more testing, therefore, no final say. We need more testing to know more about what we're testing. These laws help us know our environment and to know the other people who live in it. Our inside here, you know, you get an insight and you know something, you know? but you don't want to say it out loud because you're kind of afraid that it's not going to be really true and it'll spoil the whole thing for you, you know? But when somebody makes you say it, then, and it's true, then it just makes it more beautiful of a thing. Do you want to go for the more beautiful and say it? Who are you? Just me. Who are you? Through exposure, we learn. After all, a knife is just a knife until you've had to use it to defend your life. Then it becomes something else to you entirely. 
But in order for there to be a test, we must know what we're testing. So let's use the racism example. See, in order to understand the problem at the heart of the problem, we must be able to ask a question. And this is not so hard in and of itself. The real problem becomes the inevitable answer, primarily because of who will be asking the answer of. In our case, racists. Or to use a less inflammatory word, let's call them segregationists. We won't be punching these people or screaming in their faces. Instead, let's say we sit down with them, many of them, and ask them why they are the way they are. Have a conversation without anger or bias. Just listen to a man or a woman talk about who they are. Empathy works both ways. If you're hostile, so will be your witness. I believe the results would be eye-opening, even if familiar sounding. The difficulty in doing this test is that very few racists would be comfortable going to a one-on-one -on -one session with someone. When something is banned, people tend to go into hiding with their socially deemed deviant behavior. But those people don't stop believing in what they believe in. They don't just go away either. They still work in management, the police, and government. So just because you ban a word doesn't mean it's making a situation better, and it isn't changing anyone's mind. We are sort of hardwired to empathize with other humans. We need this empathy because like it or not, we depend on one another to survive. It would be strange then, however, if when we met new people, we immediately hated them. We wouldn't be able to work together to keep this massive machine of society running. So empathy is important. Without empathy, you have only suspicion. And if you're unwilling to consider someone else's reality, then you can never truly learn where your argument has failed because you've never taken a critical eye to it. There's a documentary called Accidental Courtesy. It's about a man named Daryl Davis, a studio musician, who went around befriending clan members, even Grand Dragons, and managed to, according to the documentary, get several high-ranking members to leave the clan, primarily because of his friendship. This man was black, and that's what I mean. He exposed these men to the truth about him, as a black man, to the point where they could no longer reconcile their biases with the reality of this man standing right before them. Okay, so what can we all do together as a nation? Help save the white race. Help save the white race. It is also very difficult to insult a man based on a factor they cannot control after he's shown you courtesy. Daryl was a man they would hate if they just met him on the street somewhere. But he was the same man who had driven them in his bus to a rally to spread their hate. And after the rally, served them drinks in his home. Not all were swayed, however. Two men left the order because the Grand Dragons seemed to be operating inappropriately with the enemy. But Daryl's impact, just out of his kindness, made changes to the feelings of these men, and to the men who gave up their robes entirely through his friendship. Empathy seems to work out, at least in terms of racial hate. It's not the final authority, but then again, well, there is no final say, as we said before. Let's talk about some of the dangers that empathetic thinking poses when talking about governance, however. By this, I mean legislating laws in the empathetic, but hardly scientific, humanitarian way. When I got out there at first to do the whole dating thing again, I met a girl. She was different. She seemed nervous a lot, and not exactly comfortable, but eventually I got to know her, and as we talked, as most people eventually will, we got to talking about politics. We got on the subject of the drug war, and if you watch my drug war video, you'll already be aware of my feelings. She wasn't a fan, to say the least. She seemed like a very liberal person, open to new experiences and so on. But on the drug issue, she was unflapping. She told me a story about a guy she had been seeing for a very long time. He suffered from what doctors called cannabinoid hyperamnesis. He was an addict, addicted to cannabis. Now see, up to that point, I didn't think people could get addicted to marijuana. And if they did, it's kind of like what Joe Rogan says, you know, we just got there first. It comes from smoking too much marijuana for too extended a period of time. You become addicted to it, and it becomes the only thing keeping you from vomiting. Some have described the feeling as withdrawing from a much harder drug. After some research, I changed my mind on someone possibly getting addicted to weed. I, it didn't change my mind on legalization, mind you. I still believe that people should be allowed to destroy their lives with whatever they feel like using, so long as they aren't affecting others. That's rarely the case with addiction, however, but if you believe in freedom, it seems odd that anyone would be talking about people smoking a plant and putting them in a prison where they learn how to become worse people 
and then take all their rights away to vote and make it harder for them to get a job. See, that is empathetic thinking at work. To save you from yourself, we take away your right to hurt others. Now, it seems like a legit way to keep people from hurting each other, but let's look at the dangers that reside in this way of thinking. In order to understand why humanitarianism in politics hardly works in law, let's explore fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is defined by a strict adherence to the basic principles of any subject or discipline. It's another way of saying that there is only one truth and we already know it, so no one can change it or the world goes to hell. Socrates was against democracy as a value, according to Plato. He described a conversation that Adamantus had with Socrates in which the philosopher attempted to convince the man that society was like a ship. You wouldn't want the average among us to steer the ship, would you? You want the very best of us in charge. If the captain makes a decision to go left, but the crew votes to go right, you are basing the fate of the ship on the whims of the unenlightened, and possibly uneducated men that know nothing of seafaring. And if you would not do that on a ship, why would you risk the same for an entire state or an entire country? That seems like a very fundamentalist point of view, as pointed out in Kindly Inquisitors. To believe that one knows all facts and that these facts are immutable and worthy of law is the very basis of fundamentalism. It seems ironic, then, that the very democracy that Socrates hated would later end up killing him. This is where liberal science gets its law no final say. Then we come to humanitarians. Humanitarians are comprised of groups of people active in communities who hold rallies, food drives, lobby congress for aid for foreign countries, and so on. If it means helping people, humanitarians are most likely behind it. The role they play in politics, however, has been a muddied one. So let me get this out of the way. There's nothing wrong with being a humanitarian. In fact, most who do it do it for good reasons, and they spread a lot of good throughout the world. But in the realm of politics, they become harmful to liberty. The viewpoint of the new humanitarian liberal, what are some are calling the regressive left and others are now coining the term neoliberal, seems to have shifted from helping the less fortunate to protecting the less fortunate. Their latest attack seems to be one that most people have a hard time disagreeing with, at least in polite company. Punching Nazis is now the goal of a new group called Antifa, an anti-fascist group that dresses all in black with ski masks and at times to cover their faces and at other times reacting violently to ideas they believe are deemed hurtful to certain marginalized groups. While I believe that some words can hurt people, I do not believe that we should be hurting one another over them. I think where any rational libertarian or even liberal might diverge is in their method of tackling the subject of whether or not you truly have the right to say whatever you want. To this group, you don't. This line of thinking is dangerous to free societies. Let's take a look at Canada as a recent example. Canada created the Criminal Code RSC 1985 to include a provision about hate speech. In it, they include language about genocides, inciting hate, etc. And in a 2002 decision by the court, David Ahenikiu was convicted of willfully promoting hatred and fined what was reported at the time to be $1,000, but in 2006, the Court of Queen's Bench overturned the decision and ordered a new trial. Then in 2009, David was once again accused of violating the law during a speech. In that trial, there seemed to be some worry over the intent of his hate speech. It seemed that during this speech, after the interview had prodded him about his opinion on the Jewish people, that his comments appeared to be improvised and not part of a plan to spread hate. So it seems that when a trial for speech is being had, the issue is not so much the words themselves, but the intent with which they are used. The problem is, in this situation, that even though I do not agree with what the man is saying, his words are valuable, because they are the start of a conversation that may not be happening at the moment, but could happen if the man espousing the hate is allowed to do so without fear. They may even agree to a debate, so his ideas could be challenged in a public space under public scrutiny, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. No dogpiling, no screaming, no bullhorns, no childish bullshit. Just two people talking stuff out, hopefully exposing the cracks in the foundation of his argument. Without this sort of examination and the intimidation that comes from espousing these beliefs in public, we stifle conversations and cause those that have these ideas to go into hiding and keep these hatreds to themselves where they can mutate into something dangerous, 
we could stop all of this crazy shit. But we are pulled in by this human drama. It is like nourishment in a land devoid of vegetation. We stroll through the internet looking for the drama, and where we click becomes more of what we get. We have reached a time in our history when information is at our fingertips, and instead of being hooked into knowledge, we are drip-fed the human drama endlessly. It further enforces our own biases while asking nothing of importance. The danger is high. Tyranny always comes disguised as good intentions. And if we allow the very freedom that allows us to call evil by its name to die, then we allow it to take over our lives. So I guess what I'm saying is this. Empathy is good. Science is good. But only one can tell us the truth. And only so long as that truth remains true. Because no one should have the final say.